Welcome back. Welcome in. This is Country Roads Confidential at Earsports.com. This is a Paramount podcast. I am Mike Casazza welcoming in Chris Anderson. Uh, Chris, I couldn't hide a secret from you. Um, I don't think I can hide from anybody who's watching this right now. Quick recap of my weekend, since you're all curious what we do on the side, right? Um, got away, wife, in-laws, Canaan Valley. Um, people rolling in at different times. We'll just make pizzas for dinner. Make homemade pizzas. People get pepperoni, mushroom, tomato. Um, I opted for anchovies. I like anchovies. I liked anchovies. I think the anchovies were the culprit to an absolutely miserable Saturday. Um, Friday night into Saturday, food poisoning. I'd never experienced before. Don't recommend it. Um, just a lot of trips to the restroom. I sweat so much, Chris. Um, I lost about seven pounds <laughs> with food poisoning. I was feverish to the point I was apparently in Savannah, Georgia, for some other reason, as I was just like rolling about in agony in bed. And then um, just because I had no liquid left in me, I think I was so wildly dehydrated. My calves, my uh, abdomen, my arms, just huge muscle cramps. And um, again, feverish hallucinations. I decided I was going to get up and go get some water or something to eat, which doesn't seem like a great idea when you have food poisoning. Um, no recollection of this, but absolutely passed out, rolled an ankle, uh, hurt my wrist trying to hit my fall. And uh, I have this doozy on my head right here <laughs> from banging my head off of something hard and wooden. Um, don't think I'm concussed, but if you see me walking around, please don't ask because I can't tell the story <laughs> more than once, I don't think. And no one's going to believe this, especially with some of the other hobbies I have. Um, this is actually because I fell with food poisoning and hallucinations on Saturday. True story. We didn't make that one up, would I? I don't know. Uh, blink twice if you're in trouble, Mike. Okay. If there's anything you go to see your in-laws and then this happens just blink twice all right we'll, we'll get you to safety it was the worst intervention ever chris <laughs> got a little heated back yeah. on track now back in the office back at work um back to whole foods thank you thank you it was hard wanted to talk a little bit about west virginia what is happening because we have been tunnel vision i've been tunnel vision coaching search meanwhile spring football is going on um football a lot of different directions but at the exact same time kind of a, a year-long I knew a call it Chris, like a like a like an expressway, I guess, or maybe even just like like one of those escalators that goes not up or down, but just straightforward would be football or or basketball rather. Um, they just kind of been heading toward a coaching search for about a year when you think about it. And yet now they finally get to actually have their coach and go some places and who knows what's, where this will go with staff and recruiting and anything like that. So kind of figure we should slow things down and corral some things. And also you have a good way to be the traffic cop and direct us on some different ideas here. I was going to say, I got a few things to talk about. A couple, you know, we got spring football starting, like you said. Um, basketball, maybe kind of starting, you know, kicked off last week with that. It, that it. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. Did, did my mic go out there? Or was yes. are we too late from a, a an audio joke about that press conference? Is it too soon for that? Never. <laughs> Never too soon. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> Let's go back to that. You mentioned a few things in one of your um we're not gonna joke on the audio anymore. Promise. I promise. It's it's been low hanging fruit for a long time. I have nearly every press conference, you know, Mike's there in person, so I don't think he gets the audio issues that the rest of us that watch it from afar get. But it's been low hanging fruit for a while. So I'll avoid it. But Mike, you were there again for the press conference, the introduction of Darren DeVries. And let's hopefully we get Everybody on board with that. Um, what were your takeaways from that? Because there was the public part that everybody got to see on the stream that you could have watched on video. And then there was a big gaggle of reporters and important people and the new coach and his family. What all went on over there? And what was your big takeaway from this introduction? So let's start with the technical difficulties for a second because it happened to their MC and their AD. And then their new coach, and like I think deep down, everybody, heck, surface level, everybody there wants that to go off smoothly. And when it's not going well, and you realize, man, here's my dream moment. I got this like bad microphone in my hand. Yeah, well, how does that how does that work from there? What's his reaction? And I'm not like rooting for anything. I was just watching. Like, well, you kind of tell, man, he's bummed out but frustrated, which 
kind of liked, you know, it wasn't just like one of those, oh, I'm just so happy to be here kind of things. And here's a guy who, I don't know, probably values preparation, functionality, attention to detail. Um, and that that bugged him, I wonder what like is, you know, what, what does he do to get himself ready to make sure that he doesn't have a bad mic for a practice or a game or anything like that, uh, figuratively speaking. So that was just kind of a small thing for me. Um, and then nothing really during the news conference stood out to me besides that one little thing, which again, you can laugh at, but you can also, you know, pull the players back and try to find something in there. After the press conference, Chris, there were a ton of people around the program who I hadn't really seen around the program in a while. Tons, not a big word, but like names I hadn't seen who weren't in their courtside seats, who I hadn't run into in the concourse before a game or after a game, who, for whatever reason, hadn't seen, hadn't heard, just hadn't even spotted. I'm not saying they were old guard people, like they were just Team Huggins and nobody else. Some of them were, but they're back or they were back for at least a day, which is a good sign. And then just the, the whole 9 and 23 of it, not everybody's going to come up and use their season tickets if they live far away every game um, when the team isn't rewarding you like that. And those seats used to always be filled no matter the record. They were never 9 and 23. But to see, see some of those people back and to say, all right, I at least want to rubberneck this one day. What's this guy like? What's the mood in the Coliseum like? You know, the, the mic stuff doesn't matter at all right there. That seemed like a lot of people were coming back in from the cold, however you want to put that. Just a number of people like that, that to me was a bit of a takeaway. It wasn't a huge number, but like I think important people or just a generalization of, you know, here's three or four people who represent a much larger group of people who, for one reason or another, want to be back, are welcome back or interested in coming back. I think that's important. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned the people who were there and it not being a large number, because I'd like to ask you, what do, should everyone, media, um, fans, take from the players that were in attendance? Because I believe, was it Jeremiah Bembry, Josiah Harris, and Ali Ragab? And that was it. Ofri Neve was there, too. He, he was not recognized. Um, up front, he was in a different part of the seated area. Uh, maybe he just showed up at the last minute. Maybe he sat there because he recognized somebody, but he did stand up, I was told. He was there as well. Okay. Do we take anything positive or negative? Like those four guys showing up, that means those four guys are coming back, or the other guys not showing up means they're not going to be there. What do we take from this? What did you hear? Yeah, zero surprise that Josiah Harris is there. That guy's just been like a model student for as long as he's been here. Say what you want about him as a player. I'm not going to say anything about it because that's not what I'm talking about here. Just not a surprise that he was there. I think he would go out of his way to make sure he's there. Also, he's like graduated, so he didn't have class probably, right? Pretty nice for a high school or a college sophomore. Doesn't surprise me he was there. And then, frankly, it wouldn't surprise me that Bembry or Regab were there because they probably should get their foot in the door right away, especially Bembry. Um, Neve, why not? I guess, again, what's his future here? I've had some people tell me, like, hey, I think he'd be a good fit in there. I don't, might even be on the boards. It's not just like, you know, deep cover conversations with sources. I think Ofri Neve will be good in the DeVries offense. Just that, how can you know with him? What is he right now? Maybe you get to find out. There's certainly talent there. I think that's important. Other ones, you really, you cross off three guys off the list. You know, a cook, a cook, and Raekwon Battle and Jesse Edwards were not going to be there. So now you're down to, nine eight people then it's seven six five because the first four people count off three more so now it's just five people i think quiz quinn slazinski has kind of made it clear that he's not going to be back on social media now you're down to like four people so it gets to be a smaller and smaller group seth wilson's gone now you're down to three people so i was doing this number in my head like how many people are really going to be there and then who knows who has class or who had to be in a lecture or who had something like this and that uh, probably more telling to me, Chris, um, and if I'm wrong, someone can correct me, but I did not see Alex Ruoff, Deshaun Butler, James Dickey, Demar Johnson there. I understand Josh Eiler was out of town for vacation. Um, I didn't see the other ones there. and I, I tried to look around as best as I could, but I think it's for everybody keeping tabs on the players. That's one thing. The coaches is another thing to me, too, because there's probably a spot or two when the, the music stops and they have a seat if they play their cards right. I believe you know, Jordan McCabe was there, like you noted. Um I thought I heard someone say Dickie was there. Okay. I wasn't in the room, obviously. You know what? Um, so I didn't see him, but I think you're, you're right. right. It is, is right a right little thinking. curious that, that because what they're expanding, expanding or going to be at five quote coaches. And mm -hmm. we can discuss that in a second. He's not going to bring five coaches with him. The breeze. So it would be curious to me if, you know, one of those, at least one of those guys, and McCabe's one of those guys, 
isn't trying to get his foot in the door, like you said, and get on the staff if something's available. Mike, that brings me to, you know, here here we are a handful of days after he's been introduced. The recruiting portal, transfer portal is wide open. Guys are entering every day. Guys are making visits now. Um, some of the we put together multiple hot boards, updated a couple of times. A couple guys have set visits. Who's doing the recruiting? Who is, is it just DeVries? Is it is is Tucker currently employed? The younger DeVries uh, currently employed as a a coach at the moment? What's going on? Well, since Tucker has signed his grant and aid, he's a student now. So I mean, he could get away with things like that. Get away with it sounds wrong because you're not getting away with it if it's legal. But if he signed his grant and aid, what a powerful recruiter. Especially we're talking about some guys that he might know from high school, Chris, or from college previously. So what would be unusual about him keeping in touch with them? Nothing, right? So that's an interesting one. Obviously, the head coach will do some recruiting. And I think I think you could probably do a like a some sort of a forensic search here and figure out that some people already are employed by the university. They just don't have a full um, coaching staff out yet, so they're not going to release it. But I would be surprised if at this point, one, two, three other people who could recruit, which, as you know, Chris, that's a broad list sometimes. It doesn't have to be just an assistant coach. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we found out that there are people who are employed to do that now legally because they've got they've really got to make some hay on this one quick. And by the way, April 1st, this is actually DeVries' first official day on the job too, so – um, maybe that falls in line, that date in the contract with some other people following him as well, or, or at least signing on today. Move you over to football now. Are By the way, anything? just it's a really good question, too, because like like I saw a name go in the portal we can talk about, uh, Blue from Iowa State, and I was like, oh, boy, we should check on that. But who do we call? <laughs> right? Like, as it's like, oh, boy, you know, usually you would get, like, just to have a conversation about this guy or, hey, would this guy be just you do reporter things. I just don't know those names yet. It's kind of a weird feeling. First time in a long, long time around basketball. Yeah. I was going to say, I posted something on the board and, you know, I think I might have put a capital P people in there. It was not from Morgantown. Like we had to dive into connections through the network and, and recruiting circles to get some intel from over in Iowa um, at Iowa, Iowa State, high school, Iowa stuff. Um, amazingly, somehow you and I both have connections to people in Iowa. I don't know how or why. Uh, but it's good. It's be proving to be helpful, and we'll see what happens there. Just just entering over the weekend. Uh, we'll see where things go. Are uh, you ready for some football? No. Let's no? do it. <laughs> okay. All the exciting well, coaching search, go. It's just like a vacuum. It's got me over there. I can't come away from it. No, you got to come back. I'm, I'm, I'll ease you into it. I'll ease you into it. We won't go straight to WVU spring football. I want to talk about something WVU-related. That happened kind of sort of over the weekend. Beanie Bishop runs a 439, the Big 12 Pro Day. He is a consensus all or all American. Can't remember if it's consensus or not. I think it was. Yep, yep. Um what's keeping him? Are you one, are you surprised by some of these testing numbers? And two, what do you think's keeping him from being an NFL guy? Because I still have yet to see him anywhere like even you know i look at some of the rankings i think i first saw him on espn ranking but as like the 35th cornerback and unlikely to get drafted what's what's keeping him from being a guy you think it's height is it that simple should be i mean they take into these measurables pretty seriously um i mean tyler orlowski i thought was one of the best centers to ever kind of go through morgantown and go through college and he barely even got a look because of some of these measurable stuff. So it, it would make think, sense, but I think that would be the one. And I just wonder if the, the obvious concern is that if he maintains that size and strength, the receivers opposite him, they're not going to be the same size and strength as you would find in the NFL. Like it, it's a hard thing to say, wait a minute, if he can make it from a college star to NFL star, then why wouldn't the smaller, undersized college receiver make it at the NFL? I get that point. I just don't think that necessarily applies here. Um, that seems like a position in particular where you've got to have some some size, uh, like height, uh, length, girth, to you because it's just so physical out there. Um, even though they have the rules, you can't do a whole lot. So then a, a part of you might counter that by saying, well, you can't be handsy, you can't be physical because receivers are so um, preferred with the rule book up there. 
And then it comes back to, can he make plays? And he obviously did. So you could really talk yourself in a circle there. He's too short, but wait a minute, the rule shouldn't, you know, penalize the fact that he's not a physical player, which even though he is, we saw that last year. And then, by the way, he knows how to get to the ball. Shouldn't that matter? Well, now you take away another thing about, well, is he fast enough? Because, hey, if you can't stay on the guy and you got to run with him, you better be able to run really fast. And he certainly did that. Chris, that number doesn't necessarily surprise me because I think he tested well um, at all of his stops before. I think he's one of the faster players on that Western Kentucky team, which had some really good speed. Don't know what happened with him in Minnesota. But people there said that if you had like a, a race, you let guys open up, he might run away. Don't forget, Chris, um, one punt return in college. 78-yard touchdown against UNC in the bowl game. You don't really do that unless you're fast and you know what to do when the ball is in your hands. So now you start thinking a little bit. What don't we like about this guy? Oh, he's not this. He lacks this. Well, he has a whole bunch of other stuff. And now something like that fourth, whatever it was, 4-4. Four, four, was it 4-3-9? 4-4-3? Four, 4-3-9. Four, 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 okay, 4-3-9. That opens up a whole bunch of other doors. Like, wait a minute. He could be able to do this. We saw what happened when you put him here. Now we know he times like this. What if we put him here? And that might be slot. Uh, that might be like a, a, a just a different position where – that size won't be as big of a disadvantage. And maybe he gets on a special teams unit or practice squads with somebody because he can do a bunch of different stuff. Um, I don't know. It just seems like it'd be an odd thing for this story to end outside the draft. But you've seen really good players not make it in before. Similarly, it's, it always seems like you look up and there's an undrafted corner or a seventh round corner who's playing and starting for like a playoff team too. All right. You're going to take me off on a tangent here with something you mentioned with Bishop and his return game. Mm-hmm. Got me thinking about the new NFL rule on kickoff returns. Mm-hmm. Does a return man become even more important with that new look? With with you know the the kickoff team now being, it's the old XFL kickoff. And when I say old, I mean the third iteration of XFL kickoff from just a couple mm-hmm. years ago, where. The kickoff coverage team is all the way down on what it is, the 30, and and the uh, kickoff return team is at the 20. So you don't have to run as far. Real quick turn returns. Does that make them more important, those kickoff return men? Like somebody like maybe that helps somebody like Beanie Bishop? What do you think? I don't know, man. I, I think that you probably see fewer and maybe like just absolute genius on design will get you uh, like a jailbreak or a touchdown more so than speed or a great move. I could see, I could see somebody having an each like that. And I could see like a, like a Devin Hester kind of talent who maybe can't do anything else, but they're like, we'll try him at receiver. We'll try him at, you know, cornerback and see if he can do it, but he's got something like that. Trenton holiday was another guy just really fast, but didn't have a lot of NFL like skill. Otherwise Parton running like a four, two, eight or something like that. So could guys do that? Maybe um, that's the obvious question, I think. But then I wonder about, what are those other 10 guys in front of a team look like now? Because you ever watch college teams practice, they're really messing around. Like not the, not the geesh, not the return man and not the two guys here, but that, that one level, those are like long guys that can, that can run and move because they got to do it in space to block people. Well, now you don't have that at all. You just don't have that space. So you could have an extra lineman, which means maybe you got to carry an extra lineman in the NFL's, um, their travel squad. Maybe you have different alignments in the field. You, you're you're more tight end than like those receiver types. What are you going to do to that to either hold up so your guy doesn't get killed, gets a chance to make a play, or actually you can give him a space where if you do have some super talent, like a tail on Austin again, can you can you just make it doing that? But I think you're going to have people who can pry those openings or create the 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 space or the 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 leverage or whatever to give you a chance, but. I think it's going to be very interesting to see coaches mess with that because it's it's new enough that people haven't figured out how to pick it apart or how to like monetize it and make a huge advantage either. How long are you going to spend drawing up kickoff return plays, Mike? Yeah, and then just like happen across Neil at the varsity club one day. <laughs> oh, coach, I just happened to see you. Hey, did you drop this? <laughs> no, yeah. that wouldn't this, be me at all. This looks good. Yeah. Um, speaking. All right, now now that I've eased you into football, let's let's transition completely to spring football in Morgantown. You had the opportunity, you and Andrew and Haley for your sports all had the opportunity to see actual Mountaineer football in action. It looked like based off of the pictures and videos, it wasn't entirely special teams. So that's good. No. 
what was your big takeaway? What, like, what was the, the one thing you're like, if you, if you could only tell the listeners one thing about that practice, what are you telling them? Mm. Oh, man, only one. That's, that's not my strength, Chris. I would say that they don't have great numbers on the defensive line, but man, do they have some impressive looking players, just physically big guys from there, there's no clear visible delineation of like, well, that guy's definitely a freshman. That guy's definitely a sophomore. Um, you you got guys like Kinsler and I, I just like watched him. I was like, holy cow. And then uh, Gabriel, another guy, a true freshman. And both those guys are true freshman, Chris, new on campus this semester. So it's not like they just got locked in the training table and ate their pounds up here. These are big guys from high school where they became big guys. So they've been carrying this around and playing this way for a while. What will that mean? Like, what will that be for them? I don't know. Will they be great players? I don't know. But that's a heck of a base to build off of. When you realize that he's physically where a guy would be a couple years later, that's a great place to start. But also, there's a bunch of those guys on the defensive line, too, whether it's Moba, whether it's – um, I'm trying to think of Keith is over there, too, Zachary Keith. I'm trying to think of other players I saw that just popped out in my head here. Uh, but when you think about what that groom might look like, had they kept Michael Lockhart, had they kept Tomi Durajayi, that's probably encouraging because you lost two two like legitimate power five defensive linemen and you're replacing them with who knows what. It could be guys in the FCS. It could be guys in the group of five. You'd ideally not have true freshmen, but to have players who at least look that part, that's pretty good because I think one thing that Jordan Leslie always says is that, you know, look for the power and then explosion recruiting. But if you've got that big body that you can build on and, and you know, unlock who knows what for you in the future, eventually you're going to find three good defensive linemen out of a group like that. So um, that's a good place to start, but who knows what it'll be years from now. Funny you mentioned Nate Gabriel and his size, because going back to, um, how was it last summer? I felt like it was even before then. Um, people there in Morgantown mm -hmm. were like, this guy's different, you know, as far as defensive line recruiting, right? This guy is different from all of the other targets they had. His body type is different. He's different. And, you know, him getting, early enrolled and you seeing him like that and feeling that same way it kind of backs that up too. So this is something that they purposefully purposely picked him, chose him because of that and, and really pushed it. And um, so it's, it's noticeable. I, does that mean we're not going to see a story about how small West Virginia's players are anonymous sources say? You know, what's funny is um, I asked him a question the other day, just about like how much more he thought he grew into a three, four, because he mentioned that, like, you know, we're going to have to get another recruiting class and we'll see where we are for the transfer portal class. I think it's probably been the first day of the interviews. Like, how much better do you feel about using the offseason to grow into a 3-4? And he went, back to, I, um, he went back to a question I asked him in the summer, I think like one-on-one -on -one in his office, about um, he, he cited the report in like Athlon, I think, where it was like anonymous coaches or something like that. I hadn't even read it. And, and he had not only read it, but had probably processed a little bit. And in addition, um like commissioned a study on his staff to go out and check his teams relative to position, height, weight, length with the rest of the big 12. And like, it turned out they were like middle of the pack, upper middle pack. So not the smallest team. And then Chris, they're just bigger now. So one, he's had that on his mind for a while because the answer to my question about the three, four the other day referenced back to where they rank and how much bigger they are. And he, he said something like, actually people forget Utah is as big as anybody in the conference. And they've been better than teams that were here. So he still thinks that's important and that that ranking, perhaps as inaccurate as it was, still rattles him a little bit. That's good. But they really kind of execute on a plan to get bigger and to do that for a couple of years in a row. And again, with Bruno Grover, some of these young guys, that's that's encouraging as well, I would think. Let me ask you a simple question here. Do you know what the difference is between a spur and a bandit? A spur and a spear confuses me sometimes. Uh, spur and a bandit probably confuses me just as often but i'm guessing minimal maybe one thing is those like uh one of those things that we just can't figure out in the top that dev explained to us am i close yeah, yeah just checking because i when i tell you i i got a message from capital s someone talking about another person player and they are very clearly an edge rusher person being discussed and he was referred to as a spur. And I said, oh boy, this is because it during that first Neil Brown press conference, you know, I was posting the updates on the board as it was happening. And 
There was a spur. There was a spear. There was a bandit. We're back to spur. We're back to spear. We're back to bandit. A lot of confusion on 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 our part, media, and fans, board members. I don't think there's confusion on the coaching staff. That's not what I'm implying here. But is there this much of a difference in what's happening position wise with this new spur spear? Because spur was part of the lexicon a couple defenses ago, I think. But mm-hmm. It seems different than what it used to be. So, yes, there's there's something different there, and I think it has to do with like probably the field. And so, I think a spur is going to be like more of a strong safety, which would be the um the cat, right? And a bandit would be more like a free, which would be in the field side. So the alignments and things like that I think I have something to do with it. So if you're coming from a shorter side of the field, or like the the formation's heavy, you might have somebody who's bigger bandit um, spur might be more of a safety body who who is just kind of more defensive back than pass rusher or defensive back than linebacker, so maybe against a different formation. I guess where I would have a hard time buying that, Chris, is like physically or when it comes to skill, what's the difference between a Bradley, a French, and I guess an Onwuka right now? Maybe Bradley is the most athletic of them, but like physically they're all pretty similar too, right? I mean, it seems like it, and I feel like they kind of play the same position, but maybe you're right. Maybe it's just a matter of which side of the field, strong side, field side, you know, short side, they're lining up on, and that's just going to be the name of that position. Like I said, it was going to be an easy question. It's not. No, not for us. Um, Actually, I want to save this one for a three-minute video. I want to save that one for a three-minute video. Okay. I just check. I'm going through my topics here. I got some other things I want to talk about, Mike. Uh, okay. But those are, yeah, that looks pretty good right there. I think. Oh man, I I I you know what? I missed one for basketball. Should we go back to? Can we go back to basketball? Quick and on basketball, the vacuum is still on, isn't it? <laughs> okay. All right. I want to go back to basketball okay. because I was looking at you know transfers and obviously everything's up in the air as far as the roster goes because. Seth Wilson is the only player that has currently entered the portal and is leaving the program. The expectation is that more will join him. Who? Don't know yet. When? Don't know yet. What positions? Don't know yet. That being said, how important is center and true center recruiting going to be for DeVries? Because there seems to be, you know, there's some research and Andrew did some research on it. Like, hey, how much does he actually use a true center? Um, Because there are a lot of good centers. When I was going through trying to find a put together a hot board, there's a lot of good centers, center options in the portal right now. What do you think West Virginia's priority should be? And is center that important? Hmm. I would not prioritize it just because I think that they're going to need a lot of skill to be good. And I think that if you prioritize skill, you can compensate. Mm. You could still scramble, I guess, and get some of the size and some of that um that muscle that you need. They um I what what does their ideal guy look like, Chris? I think it probably looks a lot like uh Darnell Birdie this year. And that's a transfer from Seton Hall who's been at Drake for several years. So he's a development guy, but you're talking like a grad student who started in the big east. Um he's from Newark, but he just did great things for them. That's not like a Jesse Edwards kind of a thing, what you saw this year. You just, you don't, I don't think they need that type of a center. Uh, I don't think that they need um, someone who they're going to throw it in and try to post up a bunch of games. That doesn't seem like their offense. If they have someone who becomes that kind of a player over time and you got to have him on the floor, great. But like, that's not Zach Eady down there in the, in the Drake offense. They got a guy who did a lot of stuff on rebounds or putbacks or running to the basket and catching pass, just being a part of the offense. But he was great for them, just muscle, ability. If you can find somebody who can is big and you can stand in the middle of that defense and, and you can do a lot of the stuff that that offense asks a big to do, that's great. I don't think it's got to be like a prolific offensive player. Um, it's got to be like a body and experience kind of a guy, which is going to be hard right now because no one's going to have a lot of experience with the, the roster. But someone who knows how to play college basketball is a big guy. I think you can find that later in the game than some of the things that they might want to prioritize in the portal. Good to me. I'm with you with so much depth, with so many players that could play that center position. And maybe, like you said, they need skill. They need skill at multiple positions. There's no need to focus on that. Dump it in the block kind of big guy. So I'm with you hundred percent. Let, let, 
it's a deep spot. Wait till later in this transfer portal draft to start pursuing the center you need to fill out your roster. Yeah. Um, and and uh, Birdie, just I'm trying to find his numbers really quick here. Birdie was uh, 11 points, eight rebounds, but shot about 65% from the floor. Um, just just did good stuff for them on offense and, and made sure he was in the right spot at the right time. Yeah, clean up guy, good job on the boards, get the easy buckets. Um, like anything else you want to talk on? We're running out of time here. And hey, we got we got a couple interesting questions for our three minute videos this week. So we got to get on those no, too. I'm good. I'm interested to see what happens here and, and how quickly everything comes together for basketball because they they have a, a chance to do something big for his first impression. So get people in place on the bench, in the office, on the roster, and then see how it comes together. You just kind of feel like when a guy has been in a place for this long, he's going to have a plan and it's just going to take everybody a second to assemble. But I wouldn't be surprised if he has a lot of things already finished and just needs to be through the HR and the paperwork to file. Is the same true about the roster? You might have an idea. Do you know who you can get? Unless you know who you can get, Chris, which may be why we see some answers sooner than others here for the roster too. Yeah, I hadn't even put two and two together with the date. You mentioned him officially starting on April 1st, and I had somebody tell me last week when I was poking around, like you said, trying to find somebody that, was in the building that knew what was going on. Was, hey, next week, next week is when things are going. And like you said, today's April 1st. He's he's officially on the job. Maybe some others will be officially on the job starting this week too. So expect a busy week this week for Hoops Transfer Recruiting for sure. Should be. We will have it all covered there online. Um, Going to be busy. Like I said, we'll just try to keep up with it and learn a lot as we go along because the who's and the how's are all new to me right now with the staff here same for everybody else so kind of a, a weird handshake again you know you process but given the way things have gone for the past month hey why not just keep the irons in the fire and, and see what we can do here uh at earsports.com until then i'm mike assassin i'm chris anderson we will talk to you then